So uh, this is the normal, the normal title of the presentation I'm doing at the moment. Uh, it's like an ch ever-changing target. Uh, it, is, it is changing whenever something happens, uh, but we're not doing it today. But I want to show one thing um, that just came in yesterday, or better said, this morning. So that will be the next big thing. It actually is a working prototype for Heisen boxes. And Stuart is unfortunately not here. He could probably tell us anything more about it. But you see something like nice here. Unsafe find Heisen box constructor. OK. <laughs> so we're skipping a lot of, so I guess everybody's familiar with some is unsafe, something like all those creepy things. Oh, there you go. There you go. Here. Find Heisen box constructor. It just showed up on the mailing list this morning. Right? Okay, so let's get to the interesting stuff. Um, we're skipping all. Um, that was the, the Valhalla. Um, so let's see. There's, we, we already talked about, uh, let's, let's start here. And I want to make this, I want to make this a discussion. And that's the reason why I asked you to, to be here. And uh, why I like that um, Ivan is here, and there are a couple of other guys that probably have something to say, like Cliff as well. <laughs> but he's in the back, so feel free to come in front. Um, so uh, first of all, atomic updates. I think a lot of people know about atomic updates in, in various ways. Um, this is probably the one you're not supposed to use. Um, like in most of the talks, the first slide is the one with unsafe. Um, but there are a couple of reasons why people did it in the past. So one version you're supposed to use is atomic long. If you want to have uh, atomic updates, atomic increments, you're supposed to use atomic long or maybe if you don't want to have an instance per record, whatever, you're supposed to use the, the field updater stuff. Uh, you can't really read that. Um, so w what is coming in in uh, var handles, and that is the first feature. Uh, we just learned it's not coming to Java 9. Um, I think only Oracle believes so. Do you still think it's coming in Java, it's coming in Java 9, var handles? You look like surprised. I, I thought it was in there. I didn't know it it's, it, it still is. I thought it was moved out. No, it's in Java 9. It's Pro in Java 9, as far as I know. It is. Yeah. Woohoo. Okay. Sorry, I'm wrong, so this was your talk, sorry. Um, but what, what is coming is a couple of, of very interesting methods, and there's something very, very bad, well, something that I really don't like about the var handle API, because all of those calls are, what are they called, polymorphic methods? Megamorphic? Megamorphic. Megamorphic. So you actually have to tell the compiler what the types are. That's the reason why you have to cast the return type. I think it's polymorphic called. Is it megamorphic? Megamorphic means that it goes to multiple targets, and the JIT won't therefore be able to inline. OK. And so the cost is generally excessive, and it's not useful for what it's intended for because it costs too much. <laughs> OK. OK. Uh, feel free to ever grab when, to grab the mic whenever you want to. Um, the, the main idea is here uh, to exchange all of those features from, from unsafe, right? Um, so we can do a couple of more things. So that is just like the very obvious example. But you can do a couple of other things. So that's, that's by the way, how you get a, a var handle. Um, so the method hand, who knows about method handles? Okay, perfect. So method handles get an, a new method where you can find var handles. Uh, you give it the type, the class name, the field name. Um, and it will, will just make it happen. Um, let me see, but there are some other things, like uh, you can actually create a var handle that puts a view on top of a byte buffer. So you can have a byte buffer that looks like, I think in this case it's a long array. And that actually makes it very interesting. Um, I just said, I guess, was it yesterday, the day before, whatever, um, when we talked about the new byte array inside of, of the string, um, using something like that, you probably could make it look like a char array if you figure out that it is an encoded char array. And you don't have to fiddle with the bytes itself, or yourself. Hmm? Um, 
Then there was another discussion that I had with Paul Sandoz, um, like, okay, now we have like bar byte buffers, uh, but they're still 32 bits, so how do we make it 46, uh, 64 bit, 46, that's a cool number, uh, 64 bits, um, that was my idea, but just forget about it. Um, so that is what Paul, or Paul and I think Ivan came up um, uh, as, as a proposal. So you actually create a scope, and inside of the scope you can do multiple allocations. And the scope is auto closable, so whenever you leave the scope, it will automatically be um, uh, uh, unallocated, deallocated, unallocated. Sorry? It's just malloc and free. Sure, just call it's it malloc. what it is. Sure, it is malloc and free. Absolutely, and I totally agree. And still, it's awesome because that is what we actually want. This is what people use unsafe allocate memory and free for, right? Yes. So the interesting thing here is that there is a pointer class and a reference class, and that is where I find it. It feels funny, especially because the pointer interface in, I guess, the first commit had a public static final, which was called null pointer. Um, they, they unfortunately for remo removed that, so they broke my, my joke, but I still have some picture of, of that in the source code. Um, but the, what I really like about that is that you can actually using, um, or the idea is that you can make this look like any kind of view you want to have it um, using the var handle view technology. So you could have just some allocated memory and you still can make it look like a long area of char area or whatever. And I think this is, this is really interesting. You, you can always disagree, Cliff, right? And um, when I disagree. added this, just to show that it is a ra running target, oh, it was Vladimir, sorry. It was Vladimir, I Ivanov, there's the Ivan. Um, so that was pretty recently still. Um, so let, yeah, let's stay, with, let's stay with bar handles so far. As I said, I, I want to make this like a discussion. Is there anything else somebody wants to add to var handles? And you feel, you're free to, to say anything. You already said it's, it won't solve the problem, right? <laughs> so unsafe has a certain, uh, has a particular property that you're missing, which is it goes straight to a machine instruction. And that's the key property that's missing. So all the other overheads, uh, there are places and times where they're simply not acceptable. The reason you're doing unsafe is you have some high performance problem or you just do this some other way, locking and whatever it's gonna be. So, so really, there still needs to be a way to boil it down to a machine instruction. Yeah, but the, so whenever the JIT compiler kicks in, this will actually happen. There is an always inline annotation on everything. It will inline right to, to the actual call itself. I, I tried it because I didn't believe Chebyliv. I'm not sure though if it works on all all situations, but it looks like it works pretty well. Sometimes I have to defend Oracle. Yeah, it's also been my experience. Yeah. It, 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 basi it, it basically does, in, in the end, it's, it's gonna be the same. Yeah. As just using unsafe directly. That's that's the design. So, okay, so so comment based so <coughs> based on uh, the previous discussion. So I think what you, the term you were looking for was signature polymorphism. Signature polymorphism. Yes, which is yes. which is a deep magic special case in the JVM spec, which I have to admit I I don't understand well enough to explain it. But um, and I should activate the microphone, I guess. Wait a second, you just said it, it compiles down to like no overhead, and now you just said it has a double trampoline. Which one is it? So the, the double trampoline actually gets in line completely. You don't see it in, uh, in the end, but you need it for, for, the, um, for the original call for the compiler to figure out what has actually is going on. It, it is kind of weird technology, to be I honest. I guess you're referring to the bootstrap, uh, to the method bootstrap, uh, that's, that's invoked dynamic. Uh, me mechanics. Invoke, that's invoke dynamic mechanics. 
So you have a bootstrap method which ultimately helps you to resolve it in, in, in an execution time. It can be resolved differently, but most likely it will resolve to the same thing. So JIT will JIT figures out, and then it basically bypasses on the next on the next invocation. It bypasses the the, the this bootstrap method, it str goes straight into the to the actual call site, and then it's it's and then and then JIT does the, the regular work of inlining or cache inlining uh, in the call site. Yeah, and as I said, there is this inline annotation on all methods, so the JIT compiler is meant to inline it completely down, which is kind of Interesting. It, it is for, well, force in line, yeah. But I would like to continue that thought that Cliff brought in. So, um, so, so the reason why people found um, some of those unsafe methods so, so useful is because it was pretty much giving a Java level direct mapping into some instructions that uh, otherwise could not be um, um, placed, uh, utili utilized by, by JIT. Um, I think there's a similar example with our JAP 285, where basically w with a single with a single x86 pause instruction, which is helpful in low latency world. And the thing is that I there was no way. Well, there was a very difficult way to for JIT to instruct to inject that. You mean you mean the spin lock? The spin lock, yes. The spin lock, which is x86 pause instruction. And uh, and so. We finally, we are happy that we managed to get into GDK, but to be honest, it's a sort of a hacky way. We introduced an, a, a, an artificial uh, method in, in the thread class, which the whole, the whole purpose of that method is to be intrinsified into a specific x86 instruction. And the reason is that the byte code, la the byte -like code language is not expressive in us, enough for us to, uh, to do this in, you know, in some intermediate format. So it seems like almost if there is a need for some sort of a an, a, an API uh, to provide almost like a, an assembler level on Java on Java level, so that I wouldn't have to introduce those artificial on spin weight methods um, in order to be to map efficiently into some specific x86 instruction, especially given that these ideas are being shared. So if Intel does uh, you know this pause instruction, ARM does it. You know, sometime later, but some, there's something similar. If that's helpful, everybody eventually gets it. So eventually, it will be mapped to all meaningful platforms. Yeah. So um, going a bit fo bit forward, there's uh, interoperability later in in this slide deck. Um, Panama is actually working on on those kinds of things, and with the with the stuff that Panama is working on, they're looking into something like user defined intrinsics, which probably is what you're looking for where you can just on a user level define those intrinsics and make sure that whenever the platform and the CPU and stuff works or actually is what you have an intrinsic for, that it is automatically exchanged. Like the normal intrinsics that the JVM has, what, what Unsafe gave us, basically. Um, one more thing that I find very interesting about that, it actually gives you a, a memory pointer. So that is a real pointer as in C, so you can pass this kind of pointer. You can put data in it, you can get data out of it, and you can pass it just to C++ down. And, and as I said, with Panama there, and we already talked about this briefly o uh, over the last two days somewhere, um, that Panama will give you some very, very interesting things. Um, let's, yeah, let's, let's go for that. So um, I don't know, I don't remember. You talked about JNI a bit, and, and somebody else, uh, talked about JNI as well. Um, so, does anybody here like JNI? Was it ever something like, yes, I love that, and I wanted to do that? Or probably not, right? Okay. By, it was by design not to be loved. <laughs> it was by design. <laughs> okay, it was by design not to be loved. Very nice. Um, not not sure if it was to, was meant to be the last. I, I, I believe the, that the, the the background. Yes. So um, yeah. Okay. So in, in in Java, that's probably a good way of putting it. In in Java, J and I was meant to not be loved and was meant as a last resort if you can't use anything in Java or if you can't build anything in Java. Um, the problem was that certainly there are a lot of things you can't do in Java because you have to go down to the operating system or in some cases C++ was faster. Uh, this kind of became 
a no-brainer, I guess, over the last couple of years, but it was in the beginning at least, uh, especially in Java 5 times, there was a lot of stuff that was faster in C++. So um, yeah, if you wanted to get the PID, I know it's a bad example because we now get a PID uh, API in Java 9, thankfully, but it was the easiest example. Um, Charles Nutter, uh, I think he was supposed to be here as well, right? As far as I remember. Yeah, he got poached by the Java Language Summit. Yeah, pretty bad timing. Pretty bad timing. Um, so Pro uh, priorities, he, he Charles. Priorities, priorities. <laughs> so Charles created something which is called JNR, the Java Native Runtime, mainly for for the use in JRuby, uh, because JRuby has a lot of libraries that actually need operating system support. And he created this library loader JNR stuff where you define the interface and you put in some methods and then you just, while loading it, you say, okay, please bind this in this case to the standard C library on the platform, whatever it is. And you can just call it. It does some magic. I think it, it generates the assembler step at runtime, something like that. Um, but it works pretty well. Um, for, for Java 10, 11, 20, whatever, uh, whenever it's gonna come. Um, so P Project Panama tries to re-implement that in, in a more embedded way. And the more embedded way, uh, again, goes down to method handles. Um, so uh, they, already, or they actually use the already existing API of method handles and inlining that is built in into the compiler. And you can do the same thing. So you have a return type of type int and you say, please get uh, the PID or get the method get PID, and it will bind it to whatever is, is loaded into the process. In this case, it's the standard C library. So you don't actually have to tell that. The nice thing here is, and um, that is where, where it's at, they, they're looking into custom intrinsics as well, is that same as var handles, this will be inlined as, fast or as, as much as possible. So you basically have a native C call um, in, in Java code. And Cliff can probably say a word or two about how this magic can happen. Because I, I think there must be some conversion magic as well. You're asking about the JNI overhead talk I did yesterday? This uh, is independent from the, the whole method handles, var handles, inlining game. It's gonna boil down to some native call and then it's gonna do the native call thing. Yeah, so what, what I think is, and in this case, um, the, the JIT compiler knows about the types and can generate the magic, just the necessary magic itself, right? Something yeah, like that. that's what I was showing yesterday, that those yeah, little yeah. stubs, those are all generated. Yeah. So, so looking at this slide, uh, it just seems to be like a JNI interface facelift. It, it, I don't think it's, it's, it's changing fundamentally into in the mechanics of JNI calls. It's rather just a much uh, cleaner, nicer, shorter interface. Uh, well, it is, it is shorter because you don't have to actually write the JNI call or the JNI stuff. And that is where, where it becomes cleaner for the programmer because you can just interface to any C++ or C code, uh, it basically is. Sorry, Which is even yeah. worse because then now you hide the JNI penalty under under a very nice slick interface. Well, it it is FFI, so foreign function interface, what a lot of other languages have as well. It, it just I don't know what you just said. There sounds like you have a misunderstanding of what's going on. Like this doesn't change the the JNI foreign function interface call overhead at all. That little stub has been generated for the last 20 years and remains generated in exactly the same way as before. It's unchanged, even given types. Because by the time the, the, the call is being made, types are known to the runtime and the little stub is not actually done by the JIT, it's by a little custom generator for it. But however it's made, it, that piece is unchanged. What this is doing is giving you a much more convenient way to make an FFI without having to deal with, right now it's like a pretty horrible game and you have to put class paths on the, whatever libraries on the command line and you have to have a bunch of other weird stuff going on. It makes it way more convenient. But it's not changing the overheads or even the way that you generate the call ultimately for the, you know, the speed for getting across the boundary. Uh, unless we're missing some bit. So maybe there's something more to it that, that, that we... No, we no, it probably doesn't change the overhead. That's not what I'm saying. I, I, it, it changes the overhead for a programmer because you don't have to do uh, the JNI stuff anymore. I, I, I think we talked about this yesterday. There are a few tricks you could possibly do on the, on the native side in order to help JVM to discover that this is actually a lightweight call. 
this isn't expressed in this slide, I don't know if that's something they're going to do, but I we can imagine if that is a call to a primitive, a, if a, a tiny native method that could be, I don't know, statically analyzed by a JVM, that it's this method is not going to do any bad, then you can do a lightweight call. I think, I think that's basically what we talked about yesterday. But in general, just finding by a name uh, some function and then calling it, we don't know if this function is going to block, is it going to mess with the, with the, with the heap, uh, it can do anything, and for that reason, we need to do all the precaution and all the slow steps that we have to do on JNN calls. Yeah, the, the, the big difference is these are standard C methods. So uh, there is not the, the environment, the JNI environment, so you can't actually interface with Java directly from C++ back. Okay, you can so still so mask with the memory. Maybe we have a naming issue here. What you're saying is that you don't have to do the C side of the equation where you write the stupid boilerplate library of C code macros that take in, you know, Java typed pointers to C land, which are actually little handles. I'm saying you don't have to do that because the, it's getting generated under the hood for you, which it, it totally could. That one, that one makes more sense to me. It goes to the hand in hand. It's a more convenient way to make a JNI call. As far as I know, there is also a plan, you know, as part of Panama to do the, the data structures layout, the, the, the memory layout, so the, the marshalling, unmarshalling for native calls should also get cheaper if it's part of the Panama, not just, you know, you so, you so passing things back You mean this back re implementation of structs? That yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. So, yeah, so the structs, structs implementation, which, which basically prepares the data structure in the format that native call expects and that you just pass it directly without the overhead of marshal and unmarshal. But yeah, but it, but it has to do the unmarshaling and marshaling. So you can do the same thing with the scope from before and, and just copy the data in the right position. I mean, this is what, what I do at the moment if I want to have structs in C++. Yeah. Well, let's see with, with, oh, oh uh, yeah, just, I'm not sure if I understood your comment at the beginning about var handles, if they're going to be in or not, because they, they are being used at the moment in the latest. Oh, it's true, yeah. So, for example, if you look at the concurrent link queue, they're using it. For um, join pools, well. Yeah. I wasn't so just sure if it was completely merged. Um, well, the, the, we, they're still asking us to please test it, which I, I promised I would do. I haven't gotten around to it yet, but... Um, they're, they're actually being used inside the JDK. So it's like eat your own dog food. Let's see, yeah. if, it, let's see if it breaks. Right. <laughs> so uh, that I think this is very important. Um, so Doug Lee actually is using var handles inside of a lot of implementations like the fork join pool just to prove that it works and is as fast as the unsafe stuff. Because he was probably a bigger unsafe user than I was. Um, just, just very briefly. Um, just, just to follow up on var handles, I, I'm pretty sure it is in. So JEP193 one, JEP one is, is, is uh, status is integrated. And if you look in, <coughs> I'm looking at the recent um, JDK9 build, which happens to be 129, there's Java Lang invoke var handle. And it's public. Very, and it's very nice. Paul did a great job on it. Cool. OK. So that's a no-brainer for Java 9, uh, beside the fact that ho probably nobody will We'll move to Java 9. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so as I, as I said, that is just a very quick one. Um, or let's, uh, one of the features that a lot of people use, including um, Hazelcast and, and me, uh, is unsafe allocate instance. It basically creates an instance of a class without running any constructor. Uh, there is always, or there was always a, another way to kind of do that, which is the reflection factory in some misc reflect, I guess. Um, I think the idea of what I heard is the idea is to move that <laughs> to to a public package. Yeah, feel free. There's a third one, third way to do it, and that's the clone. Hey, make a golden instance and squirrel it away somewhere, and then just <laughs> call clone on it. <laughs> Bang. There, there is a fourth instance. You can generate bytecode and use unsafe, uh, inject it into the system class loader, and then there is no bytecode verifier, and you don't have to call any constructor as well. Uh, we're not going down that road. Um, so the idea is to move, I, I can show you the code. <laughs> no, I believe you, I was just thinking, the clone is like actually really cheap. Yes. It's, it's like a system array copy overhead level. It's, it's 
this and it doesn't require any special bytecode hacking or anything. Pl please show me this code afterwards, how you do a system array copy on an object, or a memory copy on an object. No, I'm, I'm using clone, which under the hood oh, is okay. essentially system array copy without doing any Java ma bytecode magic. I happen okay. to be doing a lot of bytecode byte magic around there, but th that piece is just like, eh, take an instance okay. and clone. Yeah, okay. Fourth way. Agree. Um, so yeah, as I said, the idea is uh, to move this reflection factory to a public package, probably Java Lang reflect, something like that, um, and make it publicly available. You, I think it will spin up a new constructor if it doesn't create one. I've never looked into the implementation itself. You don't know about that? You look like very surprised. Um, no, 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 it's on the mailing list. Um, Yeah, I know. I'm trying to make it bigger. Oh, it's SunReflect. So that is actually a class that generates a constructor, a default constructor doing nothing if the class doesn't have one. I think otherwise it returns the normal default constructor. Probably it always spins up a new one to do nothing. Um, or, or that. Okay, you know. Perfect. So it so calls the superclass constructor. Also very nice. Um, so as I said, so somewhere in the mailing list, it was, it was certainly at some time ago, and I still hope this will happen. Um, this probably is the perfect, perfect solution for allocate instance because we don't need anything else, right? I mean, we just want to have a class, uh, uh, um, an instance without calling any constructor. Um, the actual use case, if, if you deserialize something, you anyways reconstruct this, the, the object state from from the content of the stream, so you don't really need to execute anything uh, beside the class constructor. Um, let's see, where is it? Um, value types, I think so we sorry. talked about that. So, sorry, do, do you mind yeah. just going back to that serialization thing? I can apologize, I was trying to context switch there. Oh, there's, by the way, the other new feature, uh, char freeze, char array freeze. <laughs> For, for people that heard about it, where you can create a frozen array, very nice. Um, I'll have a couple of more, to, to, uh, a couple of more points on the frozen array as well later on. Yeah. So, so maybe we can step back from this, this the serialization slide here. So what, what's the purpose of, of what you're saying about this? So, so if you look inside of core serialization, yes, it goes through some magic to create an instance without calling any constructor and then call some I'm talking about core serialization here, right? So, Java. so uh, Java serialization, yeah. So, so yeah, there's a bunch of magic that goes on, and there are a bunch of there. There are a number of terrible and serious problems with it. So, okay, so, so there's the slide here that that looks at some Sun Misc internals reflection factories. So, wh where are you going with this? What, what's your? So, um, I, I guess you know that most people don't use Java serialization for obvious reasons like byte size and speed and a lot of other things. I guess. Cliff can give you a long story about that as well. Um, and, and the other problem is when I deserialize an object, I really don't want to execute anything. I don't need to create any default state because I'm going to recreate my state from the deserialization. So beside the class uh, initializer, there is nothing that actually has to run at, at whatsoever. Don't you agree? Sorry, when, you, when you're saying, uh, okay, so you're talking about, say, Hazelcast's deserialization. You For wanna, example, you or go, JBoss, okay, or so Cliffs, or whatever. Okay, so you, you, you pulled some bytes off, off from somewhere, and you want to initialize Of a stream, them. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In um, this case, for example, you're, you read a char yeah. error from a stream. I know this won't work in Java 9 anymore. Okay. Well, okay, so I understand why you want to fill in bytes because of speed, and I also understand that there are some serious problems with, with Java's built-in serialization and reason valid reasons that people don't use it because it's terrible. So I, I don't want, I'm not going to defend Java serialization. I, I don't think you have a chance to do so that. No, no, I'm not, not even going to try. No, I fixed too many bugs in Java serialization. And I, so anyway, the, the problem is that all these, all these things are dealing with bytes and we're forgetting the application programmer. And so there's a whole class of bugs where if you look at a class, you look at the constructors, and the typical thing is that constructors establish invariants. And any 
serialization mechanism, whether it's Java, Java's core serialization or something that goes around and, and, and throws bytes into a piece of memory that hasn't called a constructor, can violate that. And so we spend a but significant amount of time in the JDK group not, dealing not, with not security holes because of this. I so don't that's, actually that's agree with that because the state I serialized has to have all the invariants. The, the bytes that you read off the wire oh. might not satisfy those invariants. Yeah, okay, okay, so, gotcha. So we deal with this problem on a daily basis in the JDK. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I'll tell you just the, I don't wanna, sorry, I don't wanna rat hole on security, but this is something, whenever we talk about serialization, deserialization, this is always something that's in, the, in, the, in our forebrains, which is when you deserialize some bytes off the wire, you cannot trust those bytes. How do you deal with that? And, and we don't know, this is, this is a problem, right? And so there's a blanket statement in the, in the coding guidelines that says don't trust bytes you get off, don't, don't trust bytes you send to deserialization. And I don't think this is a problem of Java serialization or any kind of Java, this is a general problem. And any kind of serialization will have this problem, so you can't fix it, I don't think so. Yeah. And I know there is serialization 2.0, I'm, I'm actually not aware of the state, to be honest. Um, but I think Brian is working on that. There, so there was some discussion about a serialization 2.0 and, and it kind of stalled out. So okay. it's not going so anywhere. So it's, it's at this most point. probably not gonna happen. That's the reason why there's no recent update. Okay, gotcha. So in defense of serialization. Hmm? In defense of serialization. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, I mean, I don't think anybody's ever said that serialization is fast or I think it was a anything. prototype that unfortunately made it to the public. No, no, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I just think that the, the, w the way it's made, it's, I mean, I, I, can read a, I can read a series of objects that are written in Java 1.1. I can read today in Java 9. And it's, it's this backwards compatibility that, that you get with it. And that's the only reason why it could be useful. I mean, if, if you want to exchange information quickly, you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't use it. But if that's not your bottleneck, then it's okay to use. Okay, yeah. Probably not for, for the use case Hazelcast has. So all of our customers and users probably have a problem using Java serialization. Or every, everybody who asks about speed, uh, the first thing we do is exchange Java, Java serialization with something faster, whatever it is. Yeah, it can exactly. be JBoss serialization, exactly. though. If, if, if that's your bottleneck, absolutely, yeah. But if it isn't, then um, your backwards compatibility gives you uh, a really great thing. I mean, I, I can't read Hazelcast with Java 1.1. True, okay, so yeah, fair point. It's backwards compatibility. And that's really the only, only reason why one would use it. But it, but it means you have to compile your classes for Java 1.1 to actually make it readable. No, you can, you can read objects that are written. I can read a, I can read a vector class containing strings and, and integers that was written in Java 1.1. I can read today in as, Java 1. As long as, as write, replace, and, and read, resolve haven't changed, which happened to some map class, for example. Because yes. there was a, so there as, was as a bug that was changed and so you can't read it anymore. As long as the updates have been done yeah. in a compatible way, you can read it. I mean, map class wasn't there in Java 1 at 1, so yeah, yeah, okay. table class was yeah. there. So okay, get, you, get your point. So, yeah. so in terms of com uh, performance, it's, it's a dog, but uh, there are other benefits to it which, which, um, which outweigh that. But of course, if it's speed, you know, you take flip clicks way or your way or many, many different ways. I mean, there are a million different ways to make it faster. Um, one thing which you do get with, with serialization, which is also can make things faster, is the fact that you're caching objects and only sending the same object once, which can introduce bugs, of course, but it can also... Well, it, it, it solves a very, very big problem, which is cyclic serialization. Exactly. It does, yeah, absolutely. Which, I guess, beside yeah. JBoss serialization, nobody else attacks, besides Java serialization and JBoss. I think no, there is no other serialization system I know that which resolves cyclic uh, dependencies. Yeah, so, so you, you know, you, by default, use it if it's a bottleneck, change it, simple. But, yeah, but, but, but the moment you change it, you break backwards compatibility. For, and for the fact of, of uh, compatibility or back and for, uh, backward and forward compatibility, I've never heard somebody reasoning to use Java serialization for that reason. Normally people tend to do things like s JSON, any kind of weird schema-less stuff. Jason wasn't there in Java 101. 
Yeah, I know. But as I said, I, I, I don't think I've ever heard the, the reasoning to use Java serialization for compatibility reasons. I, I don't think I can't think of so. any other reason. Hmm? I can't think of any other reason why it would be a good idea. You see? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but yeah, we, we have a reason at least. Okay. One, one reason. So, so let me throw out a, a more of a meta answer, which is Java did a whole lot of firsts. And like many, many things that are firsts, 90% are crap and you never see it again, and 10% are crap, but it turns out to solve a key problem, and then you sweat bullets over it for years later, and you're like, why the hell did you do it this way? And the answer, of course, is at the time you did it, you had no fucking clue what you're doing, and, and you just had to solve all these other problems all at the same time. And this is just one more thing that had to get solved. So you spent minimal effort, minimal thought, bam, serialization appeared. 10 years later, it's like, oh yeah, this is a pretty slick trick, but that thought that was put in the original one, there was no thought, it was just slammed out as fast as could be done. That happens over and over and over again in all walks of coding life. You just no. look backwards, like don't sweat that fact that it sucks. Okay, it sucks. And the reason it sucks is because the time it went down, there was no effort put in because there's no idea that it was important or not. It wasn't a key thing. It was simply one more problem to be solved in a sea of problems. I'm, I'm not saying Java serialization is inherently bad. I just said it's a prototype <laughs> which went out of the public. I, I'm saying Java serialization is inherently bad. <laughs> okay, go and deprecate it. <laughs> we're, we've, we, we're trying. <laughs> okay, Actually, just um, one, I think we sorry. talked about value types over the last couple of days as well, so uh, let's get quickly over it. Uh, you basically create a value class, and what, what did Brian always say? It codes like a class, but it behaves like a primitive or something like that, or an int? Yeah, right, so that was the, the main idea. Um, we had a lot of discussions if we could make uh, a linked list uh, out of value types. Um, the first idea actually didn't work because it's immutable. Uh, so value types are immutable by default, which actually makes sense from my point of view. Uh, I know that not everybody agrees with that. So if somebody wants to say no, uh, feel free. Um, so the way, and this is not exactly true, Cliff will certainly say this is, this is wrong. Um, the main idea how it is uh, aligned in memory is, is like an array. Just skip the array header. I'm trying to, to yeah, no, no, no. I'm trying to, to, to prevent you being, from being provoked. So the, as I said, the main idea is to actually align memory um, immediately without the array header. So um, in, in a stack, it will look like something like that. And if you have, a couple of, uh, oh no, it's not here, okay. Um, but it will, will align or it will be uh, generated on the stack as long as possible. We heard about the boxes and that was the nice Heisenbox email I showed in the beginning. Um, so whenever you can't have it on the stack anymore, you have to do, what, what is it, monitoring? Um, so if you have a synchronized block and put the value type in it, it certainly has to generate a real object. So there are a couple of reasons you shouldn't do. Um, I mean, there are lots of things. Uh, I think we talked about strings as, as a good example that probably will never make it into a value type because people are synchronizing on strings. Um, the question is, should, we, should, should all developers being blamed from a couple of people doing something wrong? Or should we give developers the option to make it better in the future? I don't know. That's, I guess, one of the biggest discussion points we had so far this week, and I liked it. Um, so, in, in my view, value types are doing several things at one, at once, and maybe that's not necessarily a great thing. So, so, so on one hand, you do this, get this nice layout guaranteed, you know, like you have an immutable array. On the other hand, you lose object identity, and therefore you can do things like like for example synchronization because it requires those bits in the object header which the object header is missing so you can't do that. Um, this is something we try to address in our pro pro prototype, uh, you know, Gales for more prototype and I, and I also chimed in uh, with the object layout. Uh, unfortunately that never came into the standard uh, or, or I, I don't think it was seriously considered but in any case there is a possibility to it, what we've shown with that prototype is that there is a possibility to guarantee a layout to teach GC uh, to maintain that structure, to leverage uh, CPU you know, prefetching and all those stuff, to teach it JIT 
to to not 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 to, to do extra to referencing and yet maintain the object identity. All it has is doing something different, is somehow different, uh, although it does it does look on the surface uh, similar. Yeah, so I think this is the important point. Object layout wasn't meant to solve the value type problem. Um, it was meant to to lay out the object. Uh, it still keeps a header, but um, I think if you have multiple objects, all the headers are in the beginning, and then your object layer follows up. No, no, they are probably to leave. The, the, the point it was to, to teach GC to maintain the structure as GC moves objects. Yeah, around. something like that. So, uh, whereas value types are, I think at least, are not meant to be considered as objects. There, there's this boxing stuff going on if you really want it. Um, so I would like to see, and I, I told Stuart, I'll, I'd like to see strings being value types. Because that would make, uh, the, or that, that would bring developers an option to actually make stuff faster. I mean, skipping a lot of object headers at least, for example, um, if, I, I don't know whoever looked at the heap dump um, alone all, or if you just look at all the strings that are loaded for the JVM itself, all the class names, alone the, the skipping the object headers would free a lot of memory. But there are a couple of other things, and um, so I think value types are, are very important. Um, unfortunately, they're not really a first class citizen because they have to be implemented in a backward compatible way, which is out of boxing. And, and another solution is, do you need really a, a fat object header? So for example, in Azubu VM, we have a much smaller you know, header, and we have this notion of pre-headers and a way to extend headers if we need to, but uh, otherwise the default header is fairly small. Anything else? No. Let's see what else is there. Specialized generics, I think we talked about that. Is, is that in Java 9? I don't, I don't actually know. It's not, right? No, it, right, okay. So the, the main idea is, and we hadn't had any code, we just talked about it briefly. Um, the main idea is that you get some kind of, I like to call it C++ template. Or <laughs> so you basically have generics or some kind of generics which are specialized at runtime. So the, the JVM actually knows how to specialize a type based on the given type parameter. So a box of int actually will specialize into a, a, its own class where all the um, instances of T are actually replaced with an int. So there's no auto-boxing going on, nothing. And that is actually a quite interesting thing. Um, for box string and random class in this case, there are some additional methods generated uh, which makes it compatible to, to the original generics, which is kind of interesting. So it will j still create those bridge methods. Um, and I think it's still assignment compatible to um, a box of, of object as far as I remember. I think that was the last prototype I've seen from Brian. Um, it, w it won't work for the box int, so you can't assign a box int to a box of object, but I think it, was, it, w it worked for string and random class. As I said, using some magic and bridge methods. Um, the, the interesting thing here is that it really, as I said, really is um, an integer, um, what is it? Oh, I have the set method, so this will really be a set int element. And if you have an array, it will really be an int array, which is really nice because if you, I, I think everybody knows the problem with list integer, right? You get a lot of out of boxing and it, it certainly creates a lot of problems. Um, yeah, I think here's, there you go. There is a point class and that is a value type, for example. Um, and this is also true for value types. So if you have a box int um, and int would be a value, so it's not int, but it's a value type, you actually get this, this nice uh, stuff as well. Um, apart from that, it's, it's Aries 2.0. That's one of the other things which comes in very handy. Um, I think we already talked about the, the long max value, so it will be a 64-bit uh, index, uh, so it will actually be bigger than max long value, but you can't show this in Java. Um, we have this box int array, um, which is kind of interesting because so far you can't really do uh, generic um, arrays. Um, I think this is one of the features from array-ish uh, being 
um, a specialized type as far as I remember. Something like that. So they, they, uh, for, for people that weren't in the other discussion, there is a new super type for all kind of arrays, uh, which is, which is array-ish, um, a very nice name for a type. Um, and it basically has all the methods that an array uh, represents or that an array has um, just to make it in a more Java-ish way. We actually had the discussion if I could implement array-ish in my own class, and so far we're not sure, both are not, both are not sure, but it would be nice. So I said the next thing I want to have is stringish. I want to have something which looks like a string to the JVM. That would be cool. Um, but as I said, so you get um, arrays with generics. So far you just get the warning that the JVM has type erasure and you, nobody knows about whatever this array will look like. Um, it still works. Yeah, the frozen arrays, um, I think that is my, my personal favorite from all the proposals that are flying around. Um, it's like I was looking for forever. Um, Cleaner API, um, that you can love that or hate it. Uh, the Cleaner API is actually what, what is responsible for cleaning a direct byte buffer based on GC. So if you, if you allocate a direct byte buffer, um, the garbage collector will eventually make sure that it is cleaned somehow. Somehow is this clean API will register, I think it was a weak reference or whatever, and whenever there is no reference anymore, it will make sure that one of the GC cycles will actually unallocate and call uh, free memory on the API, or on, on the, on the uh, actual base address. Um, so you can do the same thing. Um, there is actually the cleaner API will be, or I think this is actually committed already. Uh, so the cleaner API will be um, public. You can make your own object uh, to be auto cleaned, especially if you if you work with things like build scope and, and allocated memory regions. Um, in this case, it is auto closable, so you can either close it manually or you just leave the garbage collector take care of that. It's actually a quite interesting thing for a couple of, of situations where your object, well, where your application knows the object lifecycle. You're not agreeing with that. You're shaking your head like, oh shit. I may be totally dumb here, but it looks awfully fam familiar, familiar to me to finalizers. I guess, it, yes. Uh, it, and I, I almost get here Tony yeah. Prentice screaming, I told you finalizers are bad, and now there's a different API to write your finalizers. Or uh, maybe I'm totally dumb here. All right, so, so finalizers are definitely bad, and one of the problems is that there's, there's no way to control them. Um, and there's a whole bunch of problems. So one is they're baked into the language, and the other is that there's, uh, <coughs> what are the, what are the, there's this weird state machine where a finalizer can actually resurrect the object um, and so, what's the, what's the other problem? Um, <laughs> no, 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 there's, 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 well, sorry, there's another, there's one, sorry, there's another one I can think of. Actually, if you want to give the history at some point, but, but let me, there's this one more concept, which was, ah, that's right, there, so, so many objects go through a state machine, and if something bad happens in the middle, and say an exception happens to stuff, they, d you do want to backstop. To, to, to have, say, external resources freed up. But at a certain point, if the thing is actually, say, successfully closed, you clean things up and finalization is no longer, or you know, the, the final cleanup is no longer necessary. And there's no way to do that with finalization. There's no way to tell the VM, here's an object that no no, now no longer needs finalization. Okay, so in 1.4, the reference stuff came in, or is it, I forget what it was, Some, somewhere about, so, so that's, that is, so, so final, there's, there's Java finalization, and that, but there's the, the, the there's a, um, I was going to say generic concept. There's a, there's a, a non-specific concept of finalization, which is, you know, getting a last chance at cleanup before your object is collected. And a bunch of different systems do this in different ways. And um, the Java Lang ref stuff, the typical way to do that is with weak references and reference queues. So, if you have an object that needs some cleanup, the way to do that is to create a reference queue, get a weak reference to it, put that on there, and then have 
oh, I guess you have to have another thread that's waiting around for, for events to come off the reference queue and then, um, and then clean that up when, when something comes in. And then if you get closed, you can tear all that stuff down and delete the, you know, delete the thread and so forth if you actually don't need cleanup. That's a lot of work, and it's easy to get wrong. And so cleaner is just a wrapper around weak references and a callbacks to do all the weak reference reference queue dance for you in a convenient fashion. Okay, yeah, so, so that so not makes sense. Phantom, re phantom reference wrapper. That makes sense. So for for us, for the VM guys, it's basically it's it's a reference processing phase in inside the GC. Nothing really changes there. I think it's just. Yeah, it is just a wrapper around the weak references and yeah, the reference queue. It's 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 phantom references. Or fan oh, fan sorry, fan phantom. Okay. Yeah. So so. Oh, it makes sense. <coughs> yeah. There's a general fail mode for these things, and that's just what we mentioned already. Is you just don't know when they're going to run. At some point down the road. So. If oh, you, you must have just call system GC, then it runs. <laughs> that's a, there's a there's a separate interesting bug there. I, I could should go through. It's more. It's it's an entertaining one. Uh, uh, you know, the Azul, Azul collector would happily do full GCs and do all finalizers like multiple times a second. But most people weren't actually prepared to have an object that was hit by weak reference get collected on the next clock cycle, for instance. <laughs> but the Azul collector could do that, and so a lot of code just broke because they 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 were planning on it to being around for a little while after they made it, but. There's no requirement in the spec for it to be around. It could get collected the clock cycle after. So I want to talk about that one. It's just in general, the, the, the whole notion of weak and phantom and final, not final, weak and phantom rough things is all about having the garbage collector do memory management for you, but the garbage collector has no fucking clue what it is you're trying to accomplish and what your goals and, and you know, policies are. So it generally it makes a really bad way to do like cache management because it just doesn't have the right policies in place and doesn't know how to do it. And these little collector went through a long history of hacking a better policy in that kind of sort of works on average better, but it's a policy decision, has nothing to do with any kind of spec. And actually, you know, the right answer is if you have a, you know, a, 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 some sort of thing that you're caching and you want to have it cleaned up behind your back somehow, you need to manage that policy yourself and not expect a collector to do it. In my case, just recently I hit it one with byte buffers where the cleaner would clean them up on GC cycle, but of course I would just simply run out of byte buffers long before a GC cycle would run, and so I would get an out of memory error because I couldn't allocate a byte buffer, <laughs> despite the fact that I had way tons of heap free and available. It's just like, this is, oh, this is yeah. bad plan. Well, that, that is the, the reason why a lot of people actually get the internal cleaner of a direct byte buffer to clean it whenever they know the the so, option so is over. As soon as you say they know, what it means is I'm tracking a lifetime myself, and there's no point in having GC track it because I have to track it myself. Well, that's, that's the reason I, why I, I have auto closable agree. plus the clean API. So if I don't want to track it, it will automatically be cleaned up at some point. Otherwise, that if you if you go out the does, doesn't help. I still have to tell you when it's done. Well, that's the point. As soon as I know when it's done, I can free it myself. So in this case, I'm running them on a object pool because GC doesn't do it for me and so I don't even get into the cleaner anymore. But I'm just saying in general, if the philosophy is I'm tracking it, I know when it's done, then at the time I recognize it's done, I can take an action to recover the storage and recycle it however it's done. But it removes the whole point of GC being involved yeah. at all. I've always found it a mistake not to have unmap on byte buffers, direct buffers. <laughs> not to have unmap available. <coughs> you know, come on, give us, give us the ability to, you know, to do it. So, um, so I, th I I think I'm agreeing with Cliff, but I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so so the 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 I I think so I'm a library developer, and I think the only valid use case for things like the phantom references and cleaner and stuff is if you're allocating if if somebody calls you your static so from the standpoint of a library, an application's calling you calls your constructor or static factory, you allocate some external resource like a file descriptor or memory map memory. Uh, and you hand that back to the caller, at that point, you've lost control of it. And you can't use try with resources anymore. Now, maybe the application can use try with resources, or maybe it plugs it into a data structure somewhere and, and it gets used for a while until close gets called or some cleanup, explicit cleanup method is called. So, so I think for external resources, you have to have some kind of close or cleanup method called explicitly. But the reason that we have all this cleaner, uh, cleaner stuff or weak references is, is if, if there's a bug and 
the application forgets to clean it up, we need a backstop. So I think it's unwise to depend on any of this stuff for, for normal operation. And it's only there if, if there's a memory leak. Um, but you can't rely on it for the semantics. So I, I, I agree with you that it's, it's good as a backup for those who, who, who run into problems. But um, at the same time, it should still be available for someone to unmap something that is mapped. I, th I think that's a fundamental flaw. All right. Well, so in general, yes, there should be a way to, um, to if, you, if you have some object that, that represents an external resource, there should be a way to close it explicitly. Now, Heinz, you're talking about a specific thing, which is like direct byte buffer, I think. How do yeah, you but, yeah, but that's it? the only use case of, of phantom reference in the JDK. Um, I think there are a few others, but, but I think it's the common one, yes. So the problem with unmap, and there's a big bug report that describes this, is that um, if unmap actually were to unmap that immediately, it has no way to tell whether other threads might still be using it. It's too bad. Okay. All right, so <laughs> too, it's too bad. I'll, I'll, I'll dig out the bug report for that. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, yeah. going for so an array or something. So, right. So, so and that and means and that the you worst thing, it, it'll just right. crash a VM. It's not so a big deal. <laughs> no, actually, that's not the worst problem. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite serious about this. So crashing the VM is definitely a bad problem. What it means is that you can write pure Java code, no reflection, no unsafe, no uh, using, using just regular old Java classes and byte codes, and if you call unmap at the wrong time, if you end up crashing the VM, I think that's a, a fundamental error. You should never be able to load ordinary Java classes and have the VM crash as a result of their execution. So, no. Because you, you, right? If it's well, I don't know. I don't know where it is, but if that memory gets reused for something else, and then a Java thread smashes it. So typically, if, if you right. do unmap it, because you can do it with you know yeah. some some right. hacks, so and you still so use it. So the you, you, the you do end up right. crashing so the VM. The worst the worst problem is not a VM crash. The worst problem is silent wrong result. So if that memory gets reused for something else, and a Java thread still thinks it's operating on a direct byte buffer and changes some memory somehow, that yes, exactly, right? So well, not in well, Java. Well, I, I think the I think the problem is that. I, I think the. <laughs> yeah, fine. So, 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 the, the claim is it should be safe in all conditions, and I'm countering it, saying <coughs> the API that we're using is malloc and free, explicit hand managed free, explicit hand managed malloc has all the same problems, dangling pointers, double freeze, all that kind of crap. Okay, fine. So, so if you accept that, then of course you can have silent wrong results. Of course you can have random crashes by other threads who got memory that you're crushing over and over because it's dangling points. The same problem to see people have lived with for years and years. If you want to say, no, it never has that problem, then, and, and you're using GC as your tool to free, you have the issues that we all discussed about already, that GC is slow to the party and doesn't know when and how to free. So you might want to ponder a yet another solution, I don't have it, that says there's some way to have a policy that's more sane than GC that does free and keeps safety around. <coughs> or or say it's malloc and free and just tell people up front. If well, you blow it, you crash the way the C co codes crash. I think that is what, what the clean API is is at the moment. I mean, well, I, I, don't, I don't think so. So the JVM or the JRE as a library gives away the bi direct byte buffer to a user. So the user either cares about to, un uh, to free it at a certain point, and that is where people at the moment get the cleaner to call it, um, on their own, uh, like Netty, or you just leave it alone and the garbage collector will take care of it at some point in time. You don't know when, but it will. What you've got is a wrapper around malloc and free, and the occasional GC cleans up things. So, so, you know, some weird combination of free and a conservative garbage collector kind of thing. But it's not, it's not a solution that is, that solves the problem that, you know, if you fall, if you don't do anything, GC will also not do anything because your heap is big and it'll never do a GC cycle and the things never get freed and you die. And if you do do something, you're doing the things that malloc and free do and you pay the same bug price. So cleaner isn't saving you from either of those. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering if we've strayed into an area where we're looking at 
a completely different issue, which is we're using direct buffers where we really want dedicated heap spaces like we used to have with the real-time uh, Java. I don't know, and I don't know if that's, a, that's something we'd like. That is something that I'd like. Not real-time Java, no, the dedicated heap space so you could, you, where you could, you could specify which heap it was going to go to, into, and then you could say whether the garbage collect, when the garbage collector ran for your... So, so that's an interesting one that I've been around a bunch of times on. Um, my canonical example is, you know, Tomcat and file handles. And nothing to do with heap spaces, was file handles. Um, well, okay, so laughing, so maybe you've all heard it, but the same, same principle applies. Some OS level resource got used up. How do you tell, is it sensible to have the person who wants the next one of those force a GC cycle and the hope and the prayer that something gets finalized and that resource comes back? That's a pretty heavy hammer, especially in a real-time system, <laughs> to go reclaim some resources. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're running out of time. But I'm happy to, to go on with the discussion. It's really interesting.